Bow our hearts for a moment or two before we start this part of the conference, please. God and Father, we come before thee this part of our afternoon. And oh God, we ask thee that graciously in mercy thou would draw near by the Spirit and presence thyself among us in a very real way. Quieten our hearts, calm our spirits. And, O oh God, we pray that impressions would be made not only on our minds, but on our hearts and upon our conscience that as a result of the ministry of thy word, change would be effected in our lives presently for the honor and glory of the Lord Jesus, in whose name we give thanks and ask these things. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask you to turn this afternoon, please, first of all, to the book of Genesis, chapter 30. And the verse 37. Genesis 30, 
37. And Jacob took him rods of green poplar and of the hazel and chestnut tree and peeled white streaks in them and made the white appear which was in the rods. And he set the rods which he had peeled before the flocks and the gutters and the watering troughs when the flocks came to drink that they should conceive when they came to drink. And the flocks conceived before the rods and brought forth cattle or stock, ring straight, speckled, and spotted. First John, please, in chapter 5. 1 John 5. One John five twenty one. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. A final reading, Second Corinthians three and verse eighteen. Two Corinthians three eighteen. Apostle Paul speaking, but we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed, are changed into the same image, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And God will stamp his own approval on the reading of his precious word, and we'll look to the Lord for special help this afternoon to bring to you the burden that is upon my heart. I will seek to keep an eye on the clock and I'll seek to keep my face very close to this mic. I'm going to be drawing from Romans 15 and 1 Corinthians 10. The apostle says there very clearly in both of these occasions, that the lessons in the Old Testament are written for us. The things written aforetime. Romans 15. 1 Corinthians 10. Refer referencing the history of the nation of Israel. The apostle says by the Spirit, these things happened. And then he goes on to say they happened as pictures of us. And pictures for us. And this afternoon, I'm going to speak to you about the lesson of the stripy rods. Yesterday, we spoke about serving the Lord. We heard reports of the Lord's service. We thought about Romans 12, consecrating ourselves to God, and that God would fill our hands with work, work that we can do worshipfully for himself. No matter how insignificant that little work seems to be, I made reference yesterday to the consecration of the priests. And when, they're, when they were consecrated, Aaron, Moses rather, filled their hands. And they took their hands and what was in their hands and they waved it before God for a wave offering. And that's the whole idea of service, consecrated dedicated and god will fill your hands and that work ought all to be done for the glory of god whether it's preaching to conferences whether it is visiting the sick whether it's helping the saints work will come your way fill your hands with it and wave it before the lord and it goes up as a savor it's worshipful service today i want to speak about something more important than what I do. I want to speak about something more important than service. And I'm not minimizing that. Worshipful service. Aim for it. Go for it. And get in about it. But there's something more important than service. And it is simply this. It is being like Christ. 
That was why God saved you. We hear these kind of things, we're saved to serve. Well, that's all right in its context. But God saved us to make us like his son. And ultimately, he's going to populate heaven with a people in absolute conformity to his own dear son. And ultimately, as we've heard, ultimately, that is going to happen. We are predestinated to be conformed to the image of his son. And that will absolutely in its entirety be done for the glory of God. But presently it ought to be so. Don't miss that now. Just coast our way in this life. And then expect that it'll all turn out wonderful on the other side. That's not how it works. The cloak you're weaving now is what you'll wear eternally. As the tree falls, there it shall lie. Very good we are sometimes at warning the sinners. You realize as we go through the Old Testament, the warnings are to the people of God. Prepare to meet thy God. So it ought to be happening presently. The whole labors of the Apostle Paul, he writes to the Galatians, he says, I labor, it's almost like a childbirth, so that Christ would be formed in you. This is the burden. Ephesians 4, Paul tells us about gifts that the risen Christ has given for the whole body. And he says, there's some of these gifts, but what are they for? They're so that we all come. No such a thing, there should be no such thing as special groups of Christians. God has saved us to make us all like his son. Until we all come to full maturity and the measure, I'm paraphrasing Ephesians 4 now. Some, so that we all come to full maturity in Christ. And the measure of that maturity is Christ himself. So that means there's always room for progress for the dear apostle that were whose writings we're reading says, I have not obtained, but I'm pressing on. And dear Christians, we need to press on and to this whole goal of conformity to the Lord Jesus. And I want to remind us this, that God has got more to do in me than he has to do through me. Don't ever lose sight of that. We can get all occupied in doing this and doing that and running here and running there. God has got something greater to do, and that is in me. And so we're going to think about these stripy rods. A lesson that's going to, we're going to seek to use to show us how we can be less like the world and more like Christ. And I think it will help us too in relation to the other ministry that was given, given yesterday by our dear brethren who told us and reminded us that the Lord Jesus says about you and me that we're in the world but we're not of the world. And our brother, another brother brought before us this identity crisis. I think we just can maybe, with the Lord's help, draw this all together and see how we're going to make some progress and maybe go away from this conference with some hope of making some improvements in the days to come, not just keeping our heads above water and excusing failure all along the way, but to make some genuine progress. You see, in Christianity, dear Christian, dear younger Christian, and I'm speaking to the whole company because, as I've said, the Apostle Paul had ground to gain. So no matter how well we've done or how well you think you've done or no matter how old you are, you're not finished yet and there's room to gain. But it's a great thing to know in Christian life that there are laws. I'm not talking about the Ten Commandments. We all know we're not under the law. I trust we do anyway. But there are governing principles in life. Just for example, one of them is the law of the harvest, Galatians 6. Whatsoever his soul will reap, so to the flesh will reap to the flesh. Guaranteed. It's the law of the harvest. It's unchangeable. Our dear farmers go out and they sow wheat in the springtime. They reap wheat in the fall. They don't sow wheat and expect to reap oats. It's the law of the harvest. And if we sow to the flesh, we'll reap to the flesh. And these laws, they're like the laws of the Medes and Persians. They change not. They can't be altered. And so they operate inevitably in all our lives. 
Here in Genesis 30, there's another law. It's the law of observation. And we're going to see that very quickly. The law of observation. There's no escape. These governing principles, these laws operate. It, they must operate. They do operate. Follow it through. I want you, perhaps we should remind you too that as Christians we have an enemy. And he knows about these laws as well. And the enemy can't rob you or me of our salvation. But they can deflect, he can deflect us from the goal. He can hinder development in Christ likeness. He can cause us to mar our testimony. And he can so then rob us of reward that will be eternal. And so Satan knows about these laws and he seeks to operate through them. He knows how humans function. He knows the governing principle of observation that we're going to see. And he uses it for his own end. We need to know the principle and make sure that it operates positively because operate it does. There's no stepping to the side. It's either operating one way or another. We need to make sure that we use this law so that it operates for our good and for the glory of the Lord Jesus. That means, that's a very practical thing actually, the glory of the Lord Jesus. That means you and me living a life in conformity to him and in obedience to his word. That's glorifying the Lord. Not some airy fairy thing. It's not some nebulous thing. It's a life lived in keeping with his character and in keeping with his word. We need to know these things and not be said about us as Hosea had to say about the people of God of a past day. He said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Didn't know these governing principles and so they were destroyed. So let us consider then Genesis 30, 37 30 through to 39. I want to very quickly tell you the picture and the backstory because we're going to learn the spiritual lesson from the picture. Do this very quickly. You can check it all out. I would encourage you to do so. Jacob is not the villain in the story, as some would make out. Laban's the villain. Read the whole story carefully. Jacob recounts it later in chapter 31 that God had told him to do this thing that he did. The backstory is this, that Jacob had served Laban for 14 years for both his wives. The stock had done very well under Jacob's management and Laban strikes another deal. He makes Jacob his head stock man. They thrash out a pay deal. All the stock that were born with spots and stripes were going to be Jacob's wages. Fair enough deal. Fair enough. Shake hands in the deal and on they go. But Laban's a crook. Ever done business with a crook? Laban backed up back on the deal. He sent his servants. He says, go you out there into those fields and get all the speckled and spotted sheep and take them away. And that's taking away the source of Jacob's pay. Because I'm not coming here to give you lectures in biology or in agriculture, but stripy lambs and stripy, stripy and spotty lambs come from stripy and spotty mothers. That's just the way it is. So all these stately ones are taken away. And Jacob's left with a, a flock of white sheep. And Laban had intended to send Jacob away empty-handed. But God intervened in a miraculous way. God told Jacob to set these stately rods in front of the, the sheep in the, in the watering troughs. In the breeding season. The whole idea is this. That the sheep looked into the watering troughs and saw these stripy rods. And they conceived in the normal, natural way in the breeding season. They conceived in the normal way and five months later, because that's the gestation period of a sheep, 
Stripy lambs and spotty lambs were born to white sheep. God had intervened miraculously. Why? To give Jacob his wages, yes, but to give you and me a lesson. And forget about the whole thing agriculturally. If you're in the business of breeding sheep, just don't just abandon this. It's not, it's not for agriculture. It doesn't work. It was a miracle. But what is the law of observation? To teach you and me a principle, a governing principle that is unalterable. When we observe something, a conception takes place in the mind, which is automatically, eventually reproduced in the life. This law, as the law of the harvest, is like the law of the Medes and Persians, it altereth not. It can't be avoided. There are three stages. If you're a note taker, take the note. Stage one, observation. That's with the eye. Stage two is conception. That's in the mind. Stage three, reproduction, and that will be in the life. The law operates in us all. Now I want us to hear, we'll do this, the negative first, then we'll finish with the positive. I want you now, and I want myself to hear it and you to hear it. We're all here in the presence of God under his word. I hope we're like Mary, sitting in subjection to the word. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Oh, there's no idols in Manitoba. Stop, hang on a minute. Idols, objects, or persons that we put in place of God, or give, to the, give the place that we ought to give to God, I can't specify them all, but they all distract from the goal, which is Christ. We heard it yesterday, and I want, I'm glad to notice that our brother made it clear it was Paul speaking personally. He wasn't speaking about you and me. We should be able to say it. Paul said, for to me, to live is Christ. What about it for me? What about it for you? Honestly, in the presence of God, for, for to me to live is what? May, may the Spirit of God challenge us to, to fill in the blank. To me to live. I had this sad experience just a few weeks, just a couple of weeks ago. My, my dear wife she told me about something that was happening that she was brought to her attention. And you know what the summary of it is this? For a certain person, to me to live is sport. That's a tragedy in a Christian. Idols that we put in front of us. There's a conception in the mind and there's soon a reproduction in the life. It says God through to his ancient people through his Ezekiel, they became estranged from me through their idols. Did you, did you know, dear, dear Christian? That idolatry is the downward road to immorality. Romans chapter 1, take your time and go through it. They were unthankful, ingratitude. And then there was idolatry. They worshipped the creature more than the creator. And then there was immorality of every kind. You see, they worshipped and they served idols. Immorality of every kind ensued, uncleanness, vile affections, fornication, yes, and covetousness, and envy, and pride. And before I'm just done flicking down through Romans chapter 1 for you, I want to stop at 32, it's the last verse. And he's talking about what made the way the world works. Just people not only do these things, but they take pleasure in them that do them. 
you know what the modern paraphrase says about that? Referencing the world and how they treat other people, their idols, their pop idols, their sport idols, etc. It says they hand out prizes. They not only do these things, but they hand out prizes for those who do the worst things best. That's the world that we live in. Look at who gets glorified. I wouldn't even care to name anyone. But look at the lifestyle. And look at the world glorifies it. And exalts them. And has it in your mind and in your vision. Think of the modern celebrity culture. Actors, entertainers, sportsmen, sportswomen. Dear Christian, you do not want to be like them. And stop occupying yourself with them. Because this law operates. Observation, conception, reproduction. You know the kind of lives they live. And there's parents here. May God bless you. They'll always be your children. Always, always, always. You don't want your children turning out like these people and their lifestyles. Then don't set these idols before them because it's going to be reproduced because this law works. This law works. This is the law of the Medes and Persians. If you set these things in front of them, that's what's going to be ultimately reproduced in their lives. And Satan knows this. So be careful what we set our eyes on. And even in these modern days, and I'm not much up on technical stuff, I can tell you that without giving any secrets away. But you can control what you look at. You can control what you look at. It's in your gift to control it. Oh, it's everywhere. Yes, it is everywhere, but you don't need to be looking at it. If your eye offends you, the Lord Jesus, when he was here on earth, read directly from his own lips. If your eye offends you, pluck it out. There's a principle there. It's not talking about literally. We mentioned it yesterday in Romans 6. Don't yield your members as servants of unrighteousness. Your mind's one of your members. Dear David, in Psalm 101, says, I will set no evil thing before my eyes. Why, David, why? Because David knew the law of observation. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. If you shall end up like them, keep yourselves from idols. Dear parents, as I haven't covered it, I have covered it, I know, but I'll cover it again because it's a burden. Keep your children from idols. Keep them from idols. These so-called heroes, do you know what they've sacrificed to get where they got to? Do you know the casualties along the way? Do you know the fallout from all of that kind of a lifestyle? It has ruined lives. When you think your son or your daughter, he'll manage through it all and he'll be a wonderful star and he'll still be. Not at all, not at all. Get the view of them for the long view. The view of another world. This world passeth away and the things that are in it. Love not the world nor the things that are in the world. For this world passeth away and the lust thereof. Now let's get this more positive before I sit down. We've established the law. I hope we've got that impressed in our minds and our hearts. The law of observation, observation, conception, reproduction. So how are we going to get more like the Lord Jesus? Dear Christian, that's the great thing about this law. It operates positively because the law works. This principle automatically works. It works all the time. Turning away from Paul, from John's warning to the little children. Turning over to the Paul's exhortation to the Christian. To you and me, same people that Paul's speaking to, that John's speaking to. It says, we all. You see, I said earlier, Ephesians 4, what we're told there is that there's provision for us all to grow, and all to be like the Lord Jesus. And all to come to full maturity. There is no excuse for immature Christians. 
And if you're immature and you've been on the road for 30 years, that's your fault. There's things we need to go in for. Think again back to yesterday, Romans 12. Consecrate ourselves to God and go for it. Paul says we all, every Christian, he's not speaking to brethren or older brethren, or he's speaking to young women Christians and young men Christians and older women and older men, all of us, let's not get exclusive. Let's not get this idea, we'll have a little special group. This is for all, and so is all the word of God, for all the people of God. We don't need special little groups for this and that and the next thing, because it all should be the way till we all come to maturity. And now we want to use this positively for our good and the Lord's glory. What are we going to do? We're going to observe him. Psalmist again, I have set the Lord always before me. How are we going to do that? The Lord is in the scriptures. I think someone has mentioned it. The Lord Jesus on the road to Emmaus. In all the scriptures. And at that stage, the New Testament wasn't in print. All the scriptures, the things concerning who? Himself. They testify of me, says the Lord Jesus. And I want to say this before I go a little further. Make sure we're going to have a picture of the Lord Jesus. And I want us to have a beautiful full-orbed portrait, a masterpiece, painting of the Lord Jesus before us, not a caricature. Do you know what a caricature is? It's a kind of a cartoon drawing where certain features are exaggerated and other features are minimized. It's still recognizable. If someone drew a caricature of me, you would know they'd done a caricature of me. But you see, they would have certain features way exaggerated, and other ones minimized. Make sure we have a portrait of Jesus Christ in front of us, not a caricature. I'll run through some things very quickly. I, I hope your, your mind will run further than mine. But we can see him in the Levitical offerings. I just want to touch the meal offering. The fine flower. Whiteness. Evenness, balance, the great need of our day is balance. Smooth and silken, silken whiteness, without a roughing grain, the fine flower in its beauty. The Lord it portrays the Lord. No leaven, leaven's always, always, always a symbol in the Bible of sin and evil. No heaven in the meal offering. Honey, nature's affection. No, it's not in it either. And he's the blessed man of Psalm 1. He walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Stands not in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night. Negatively, walks not. Positively, his delight is in the law. Let's touch the Gospels for a minute or two. Someone mentioned it in the report. There's our dear brother from the Northlands. Reminded us about the Lord Jesus. He's got a heart for little children. And a heart for the poor. And a heart for the widows. And a heart for the bereaved. And this blessed man who is the resurrection and the life. Stood at Lazarus's grave. And tears ran down his lovely face in sympathy. And yet, keep it all in balance. Don't let's just draw a caricature now. He exposed the, hypo the hypocrites and their hypocrisy. He refused to ask, to answer loaded questions. He said, tell me what, you answer my question first. No, 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 we can't answer that question. But I'll just go you away because I'm not going to answer yours then. He deals with these things. 
and he rejected. You see, nothing was just done for appearance with the Lord Jesus. You and I, I think sometimes we do things because of appearance. It wouldn't look good if I did that or didn't do that. But the Lord Jesus was never motivated like that. Balanced picture of him. Do you know? You know that he loved his mother. He demonstrated that from the very cross of Calvary. Son, behold thy mother. But do you know that there was a day when the Lord Jesus was very busy in God's service? Someone came and said, your family and your mother's waiting outside for you. They want to speak to you. He rejected that claim. It was out of place. Wouldn't look too good now. Mother's calling. Family's there. Now I know, keep this all in balance. But on that occasion, the Lord who always was right. No, no. He says, who's my brother and my brethren? Are these people that are here with me? He rejected family claims. What a difference that would make in a whole lot of assemblies in Christian life of people that rejected family claims. Oh, it's Mr. So-and-so's son, is it indeed? You see all these things, we keep it, it's, it's Christ that's before us. I want you to think about him in John chapter 2. The man who made wine for the wedding. The lack of joy he replaced, he gave, filled the fool up with joy. But in the same chapter, he had a whip for the money changers. Balance. Balance. And you know this? That many, many people had known that it was wrong to turn the house of God into a house of merchandise. And nobody said a word or did a thing about it. We would say, oh, it wouldn't be Christ-like to mention it. Balance. Righteousness, truth, devotion to God. That's what motivated him. These things ought not to be here. And someone should have said something years ago. And the Lord Jesus comes in and he drives them out. We were looking, those of us who were gathered on Friday afternoon for the Bible reading, were thinking about the Apostle Peter. And he spoke about his beloved brother Paul, and we mentioned that in Galatians 2, Paul, in love to God and righteousness, rebuked Peter. Well, it wouldn't be very Christ like. Wrong. Wrong. Paul was absolutely Christ like. Peter was out of line, and he was taking others with him. And Paul steps in with the power of God and the grace of the Lord Jesus and with righteousness. Said Peter, no, this is wrong. And Peter was a good man because he said later, you know, Paul was right. Beloved brother Paul. Dear Christians, as we draw this to a close, observe him. I have said the Lord always before me. Psalmist again, behold the beauty of the Lord. Behold the beauty of the Lord. Then he said in Psalm 90, let the beauty of the Lord be upon us. It's only going to happen if we are occupied with his beauty. And there's something else in the Psalms I've enjoyed too with this, on this connection. Psalm 45, so shall the king greatly desire thy beauty. Beauty for him, beauty for him. The old prophet Isaiah, I think it's chapter one. He said, cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Keep looking at the Lord Jesus and don't look at these things or these people. And we'll find that through time we we'll become less like these so called heroes and more like the Lord Jesus. The principle works morally. And I say again, what you are weaving now, what is what you will wear eternally. There are eternal consequences from the lives that we live here on earth. There's the judgment seat of Christ. And it's not a Sunday school prize giving. It's a righteous, full of assessment of our whole life and our service and how we treated one another. 
And then the die will be cast and will not come down here to try again and do better the next time. We've only got one run at this. And the principle works morally. And I do believe the principle works physically as well. Don't you know that Moses' face shone when he spent time with the Lord? Don't you know that Stephen's face shone? Speaking to a brother the other day, saved out a very, very difficult background. His old mother somewhere, she, he went to visit her. He's been saved for years. Shows all over the man. He says, my mother said to me, how, how, how do you know, how can I know that you're forgiven? She wasn't talking about herself, she was talking about her son. I said to the brother, I said, brother, you should just have told her one thing. He said, what's that? I said, you should have told her to look at your face, because forgiveness is written all over it. It's made a change. Remember the lesson. The straightly runs. The law of observation. That is, is the law of the Medes and Persians. That alter it not. Observation, conception, reproduction. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. And we all looking on the glory of the Lord with unveiled face are transformed according to the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord, as we occupy our minds and vision with the Lord Jesus, the Holy Spirit works and reproduces Christ in you and me. And the hymn writer wrote those lovely words, O fix our earnest gaze, so holy Lord in thee, that with thy beauty occupied we elsewhere none may see. Amen. Let's just turn our hearts again to the Lord. Father, we have come together to hear thy voice, and we thank thee that we shall not leave this place disappointed. We bless thee for the many ways in which thou hast spoken to our hearts this day. Grant now thy help for these remaining moments. We pray for thy grace. In the name of the Lord Jesus. I'm glad of the candor of some of those that I'm honored to share among a conference time like this. These meetings do terrible things to your constitution. I likewise was on the verge of cancelling my flight. I'm not sure what young people think of preachers. Please, if there's any deconstruction to take place, let's do it just right here. We are men of like passions. We are frail servants of the unfeeling servant. And we feel our weakness behind a desk like this. And I needed that ministry, Peter, today. I've spoken to you personally, but I say it publicly. For there is a very real danger that as we stand with burdens in our hearts to speak the truth, that we can convey a less than compassionate spirit. And can I say, if that has been the impression, may the Lord forgive me. For our hearts should be enlarged like the heart of our Savior. We bowed low and stooped to the least. 
And may we have something of the grace of the one. When faced with a man who was from head to toe disfigured by sin, he reached out his hand first and touched him and said, I will be my king. May God grant us grace. I, I come to you here in a sense, I feel like the lad only, I feel I've only got one loaf and no fish. And hence the miracle must be great. But what has been laid on my heart, I trust I can just in these few moments, it will not be in any great detail. I just want to leave something with you that has thrilled my heart. It goes a slightly different direction. And I have been so glad to consider that ultimate to which our hearts are drawn to the glory and of that day when we shall be free from the shackles of sin. And as we consider that in all our frailty and all our weakness and all the things where we have failed the Lord and of which we are now embarrassed to think of that day when he shall look on us, having cleansed us from all spot or wrinkle, and having had presented to the Father those that he has suffered for and died, we shall in that day be what we ought to be. And we would say today, Amen, in so come, Lord Jesus. Let's turn to the Psalms, please, just one more time. I, I want to take our reading eventually from Psalm 27, but while you have your Psalter open, I, I would just want to remind you that the Psalms are not put together in some haphazard manner, but they are divinely arranged and they have a purpose in them. And I don't want to shake your faith here because where I begin projects beyond the experience of the Messiah. And I'm speaking now of David as the Messiah. Messiah means anointed one. And David is, in this first book particularly, he is the center. He's the representative of the nation. And when he prays for preservation, he's praying as a representative of his people. It's not an ego. David feels his vulnerability as the Lord's anointed, the Messiah. But the marvelous wisdom of God is that projecting through the, the, the foggy and, and faulted lens of this earthly Messiah, David, we get a sight of that glorious Messiah, the son of David. And so we're used to Psalm 22 in this manner. Something that projects beyond the experience of David. But remember, David had experiences that brought from his heart the anguished words of Psalm 22 when he felt God had forsaken him. When people had turned away from him. But God had brought him in and he'd established him. And in the nation of Israel, he was now the leader of their song, just as our Lord Jesus on the grounds of his victory at Calvary, and by the power of his glorious resurrection, leads us as his people. So the ancient Messiah, David, he declared the name of the Lord to the congregation. And then he settled into the lovely truth of chapter of Psalm 23, as he, the, the, the young youthful shepherd of the sheep, now the, the established shepherd of his people. And he rejoices in this. The Lord brought me through it all. You'll, you'll see the progression of his thinking, reflecting over those days of anguish whenever the enemy was against him and he walked through the valley and the Lord was with him. And now he looks forward and he says, I'm looking forward to a day when I'm going to leave this earthly realm and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And then he wants to do something else. Psalm 24. He's established in the nation, no longer rejected. And now he's their shepherd. And what does he want to do? He wants to bring back the Ark of the Covenant. 
He wants to lift up the heads of the gates. He wants established beside him the throne of Almighty God. All lift up the heads. And he brings in the very symbol of the throne of the Almighty God. And he makes a booth for it in his city. Says David, God put me on this throne, but this throne answers to that throne. And now as he establishes in Jerusalem the throne of the Almighty God, he comes to his 25th, where he says, show me thy ways, O Lord. Why has he brought the very symbol of the presence of the Lord into the city? He wants God to direct him. He wants God to be sovereign. He wants God to show him the ways. That he should go. And then he comes. As we follow down through Psalm 25. He says oh, oh my God I trust in thee. Psalm 26. I have trusted in thee. He's moving on. He's progressing. He's deepening in his experience. Here is God's. Of God's. Throne in the city established. Here is the king being directed by his presence. And now he says, I've trusted. I've trusted in the Lord. And so I encompass the altar of the Lord. And I have loved the habitation of his house. And then we come to our Psalm. Psalm 27. Verse number four, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in his temple, for in the time of trouble he, will, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. It reaches this climax. I hope you followed the flow of the sands. And he's coming now to this single vision of his life. David, David appreciated his Lord personally. But the burden of my heart is to get across the fact that David also drew strength and solace. From the house of the Lord. And all that that meant. You know, that's the distinction of expressions. The end of Psalm 23. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for ever here. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. The burden of Peter's ministry has been to lift our eyes to this great consideration and this hope and this certainty that stabilizes us in the midst of a shaking world, that we shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Nothing can change that. And those that get that vision in their heart will more and more appreciate what he now says. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. God has a house there. It's perfect. God has a house down here as well. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. I think one thing we've all learned this way, that way, whatever way your mind may go on the whole situation that has come upon us, one thing we have learned is this. We need the fellowship of the Lord's people. 
and we have lost out personally through the lack of that. There is something about being house of God. Just so that you can link on to this, and I, I don't have the time to deal with this today, but for inquiring minds that may wonder why I'm making this application the way I am, please bear in mind the words of Paul to Timothy, as he in his first letter speaks to him concerning behavior that is suited for that which is by character, House of God, Church of the Living God, pillar and ground of the truth. What's he speaking of? God has just one house. But each and every local church ought to be characterized by the house of God. And so as he writes to this younger man, he is speaking of the fact that as we come together, we are coming under the administration and the sovereign lordship of our God. That's where I leave that point. But as I seek to apply this to our hearts today, I ask you the question I ask the older brothers and sisters as well. What's the prime purpose for us gathering together? It's not the building. Uh, but we have teachings. Well, we do. We do. We thank God for them. We have a way of doing things. Well, everyone has a way of doing things. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord. If we ever lose that, we have lost everything. If we are maintaining a tradition, if we're carrying on something that has been carried on for the sake of carrying it on, if we ever lose sight of the beauty of the Lord, we cease to function. No matter how well we may look on the outside, the Lord will say to us, like he said to those of an ancient time that has a name to live, but you're dead, you're dead, you've lost your vision. And so may God grant us help just to draw some of the great benefits of seeking the Lord. I mean, it's in his name we gather. We re rejoiced this morning, a few of us, uh, as we were there, and it thrilled my heart in Austin this morning. We gathered in the presence of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, and we felt it in our very souls we saw it. We lose that. May God drive us again to our knees. For this is it. It's his name, his presence, his glory. Oh, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. That it becomes a part and parcel of my being. People know that I'll be there. I'm not just to get the tick. I know I, 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 I'm not speaking against anyone here. I haven't got a clue if you do it. I know places back home and they keep a register. Like a Sunday school register, brother so and so was out today, and brother sister so and so was out. And they look up the register. That's not why we're coming. We're coming to see the glory of the Lord, to admire his beauty. 
And as we come, as we come to inquire, for in the time of trouble, he shall hide me. I can only bring this to my own life. I share this with you. I worked for years in an office for the only time I heard the name of my blessed Lord Jesus Christ was in constant blasphemy. Day after day, phone call after phone call, it grieved me to my very soul. And so when midweek prayer meeting came around, sometimes I almost wept when the first brother rose to his feet and magnified the name of the Lord Jesus. But was it becoming to me as I glimpsed again the glory of his person, the beauty of his countenance, this gathering of the Lord's people, a little prayer meeting in the middle of the week, it became to me in a time of trouble, a hiding place in his pavilion. Search that word out. Hebrew, you'll discover, is so closely associated with that, that word for the covering of those cherubim over the mercy seat. Oh, such a holy thing. The angels looking down upon the blood of a propitiation that brought them in before God and, and in covering in all of God's justice. And as we come into his presence as a company of the Lord's people, for that to be a sanctuary, for that to be a place, where we can be hidden. The secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. We have been brought in to truths that people in the past knew nothing about. And for those people, dear folks in this world, who know nothing of his glory, things that they cannot understand. You read 1 Corinthians chapter 2, where Paul speaks of the wisdom of the world and God's revelation through his Holy Spirit. You think of what the princes of, of this world never knew when they crucified the Lord, Lord. The youngest child of God in this audience has been brought in to divine secrets. We know what's happening in the world. In this day when the king is rejected, he took his disciples aside. He says, I want you to understand the mysteries of the kingdom. The world can't figure it. What's happening in our world today? I tell you what's happening. There are those that are the children of the kingdom thrust into the world with the gospel. There is something that began so small that is growing, stretching to the world. There is pure doctrine that has been committed. Yes, we know in each of these the devil comes and he attacks, but the kingdom grows. The world doesn't know it. But we've been brought into the secrets of divine purpose. He set me upon a rock. He establishes our goings. Not only have we got this joy of having a sanctuary, of having the secrets of his purpose, of being established firmly upon a rock that we cannot be moved. He says, I have the opportunity to offer sacrifices. To function as a priest, you pray at home. That's good. But as we come together, priesthood is representative. And as a young brother rises, speaks to God, he represents me and every sister. 
functioning as priests, not only sacrificing in our homes and our hearts, but sacrificing in the house of God. Listen to the words of the song, draw me and we will run after thee. How many times my hardened heart has, has been like stone as I walked into the building and I sat down, looked at the emblems and said, Lord, I'm, I'm not worthy to be here today. I have nothing to give. I've read the passages. I've flipped through the hymn book. And my heart is still like stone. And the brother gets up. Gives out a hymn. And there's just that little bit of warmth begins to come in. And then my brother rises. And with breaking heart, he thanks the Lord for the glories of his son. And I can feel at least a pulse. Draw me and we will run after thee. Oh, the joy of being drawn by the prayers of others. So he says, I will sing. Not only sacrifices of shouting. You wonder sometimes, why do preachers shout? Well, maybe that's because I'm Irish. Sorry about that. It's because David gives us the excuse. There's something to shout about. And I, I know that I appreciate and I really have to take on board. Me more than anyone has to take on board what I've heard today. And sometimes the intonation can be misunderstood from, from a feeble heart. Somehow we can sometimes give the impression we have this all sorted when we haven't. But oh, through it all, having seen his glory, I will sing, yet I will sing. I will sing praises unto the Lord. That's why. That's why. It was David's one desire. Now, what I want you to do, for had I a full session, I would have done this. But I don't. I'm going to sit down. Time's over. What I want you to do in your own private meditation. It's turned to First Chronicles, and you'll see this all worked out. You'll see the moment when the king is accepted. And he's among his brethren, bone of their bone, flesh of their flesh, Psalm 22. When he leads them in praise, when he reflects back upon his time of rejection, Psalm 23, and the Lord was with him. When he brings into the city... The ark of the Lord that he establishes with singing and with praise and with worship. He, he encompasses God's temple. He seeks God's face. It's all there and in order. And then he says, oh Lord, there's something wrong here. I built my house. And the Lord's dwelling in a, in a tent. I love the heart of this man. He calls Nathan. Nathan. But you're going to tell the Lord, I'm going to build him a house. Nathan says, like, like some of us, we're all like this. We just judge it in face, at face value. And Nathan says, well, that's a great idea. It's a great idea. And then Nathan goes home and the Lord says, Nathan, it's not a great idea. David's not going to build me a house. But oh, there's always something sweet. In God's refusals, always something sweet. David had a burning desire to build a house for the Lord. The Lord said, gently, no. Let me tell you what I'm going to do for you. We've heard about David Gooding. I owe so much to my brother. One of the gentlest giants. I have ever met patiently taught me the word of God opened my eyes to some of these things that we've discovered in his word and how he let this little mind of mine begin to understand what the Lord was doing as he said to me the Lord said to David You'll not build me a house, but I'm going to build you a house. I'll establish your house, your dynasty, not a dwelling, 
David was thinking of a dwelling for the Lord. The Lord says, I'm not going to build you a dwelling. I'm going to build you a dynasty. That one day your, your seed, your son shall rule forever. Wasn't that the gentle left down? Wasn't it? I mean, how disappointed would you be after that? You say, oh, I've got in my heart, heart to build and do something for the Lord. And he says, no, 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 no. You, thank you very much, but you're not going to do that. But I'm going to do something so infinitely greater for you. Isn't that our God? Isn't that our God? In all our feeling, stumbling ideas that we come up with, Lord, wouldn't this be a great idea if I did this for you? The Lord says gently, thank you, but no. But I'm going to build a house for you. And so David, he said about, as you go to the end of that first book of Chronicles, I urge a rising generation to study them. He says, well, if I can't build it, I will prepare for the building of the house of the Lord. I will pay the price for the site. I'll prepare the people. I'll hand down a pattern. But more than any of these things, the manner in which it shall be done. He says, I want you people, as he calls them together, to understand the driving motive of my heart. I've set my affection on the house of the Lord. And then he said to a rising generation, as I say now to you. Allow me the chance to read it because my memory is not good. And who then is willing to consecrate his service this day unto the Lord? The house of God, if anything, has to be built in every generation. And I ask you as I sit down, as we break for something to eat, all reflecting over what we have heard today and over the weekend, and the value of the house of God that has flooded our hearts as we now can come and have fellowship and can embrace and shake a hand and embrace the believers and joy in the, in the fellowship of, of worship and teaching. To a rising generation here on the prairies of Canada, can I ask you, who then, who then, on the basis of all that David was prepared to do, with all his might, he says, and the motive of his heart, he loved the house of the Lord. He says, who then is willing to consecrate his service this day, this day, unto the Lord, then. I love that next verse. Then the chief of the fathers. And they with whom was found. And the people they brought. And filled their hands with what God had given them in private. And they gave it to the Lord. They were consecrated to the building of his house. Let us not miss this one thing. The one thing of David's desire, that in all of our assembly gatherings, in all that we do and say, that we will behold his beauty and inquire in his temple. Well, uh, thank you all the best this afternoon. Here from Peter Ramsey, Mike Knox, Alan Smith, and Leslie Craig. And uh, I think we just like all to extend a big thank you to those who came here with her to serve us in teaching us from the Word of God. And I think we did have a burden. Uh, 
I just uh, opened this conference with a note of thanksgiving, and I thought it was an appropriate way to end it here. My son, the house of the Lord. I think that's a challenge for all of us as we go home to our home assemblies. Go home from here. We've been, we've been blessed. How we go to our own, own places and uh, I think just take that encouragement with us to appreciate the house of the Lord. I want to thank those who served in other ways too this weekend and it's been a nice responsibility to serve us in uh, many other ways. Thanks to everyone who came and uh, we do appreciate everyone who's here. And it was a blessing to see everybody here after three years. I'm just going to give a few other announcements right now so that we can keep the uh, announcements tonight to a minimum. We remind everybody that uh, there is going to be a conference next Friday as well in Glen Ewan, and uh, all are welcome to go there. It starts at Friday at 2 o'clock. The uh, Bible Experience Display is going to continue for the next few days, so I believe that's River Road Hall as well. Uh, there's also, for those that aren't going to the Glen Ewan conference, Next Saturday morning, there's going to be a, a, a work fee for those that are able to help to uh, work in Becky Q's yard for getting ready for Biolicious Camp. So, if anybody has been helping out there, we'll be meeting at 9 o'clock at River Road, going up there for a few hours of uh, yard work. So, just uh, be great to like, help out with that. The uh, break now for supper. And then uh, we're going to have a gospel meeting to finish this conference starting at 7 o'clock. Our brothers Steve McCandless and uh, Leslie Craig are going to uh, take that meeting. And we encourage everybody who's here to be possible to come back to that meeting. It's always a wonderful opportunity to hear the gospel and, and uh, the truth of it. Whether we're those of us that have been saved for many years or maybe those that uh, are searching. Please come back and hear the, the gospel tonight. So, someone could just uh, close the meeting in prayer and give thanks for the meal. That would be great. Our father, our silence here just now is thoroughly not a little vacation. Nervousness in our heart. We search. We can all say, search for God and find him. We've been blessed, Father. And yet we're comfortable now. Lord, that we might be better represented for Christ. That we might have that gentle and meek spirit of our Savior. That we might have a tender heart one for another. That we might have a greater compassion for those who have not been so privileged to see the things that we see and to hear the things that we hear. We just pray now, Father, for this closure to a conference and for those who were able to be here who came with very heavy hearts. They've been struggling with issues in their life. And we just pray, Father, that Satan might not take that seed that has fallen into their hearts and to good breath. And we pray that as we go forth upon our regular life and our duties, that we might not forget the things which we've heard. We've looked into the perfect law of liberty. 
we have beheld ourselves. We are exhorted not to forget what manner of person we are. How oh, good, Father, that we have been now directed to the glorious person of thy Son. Well, we thank you, Father, that we've been given the capacity to, to uh, negotiate or to navigate in a realm that is invisible. To be able to truly see the beauty of the Lord. To truly know something of the house of the Lord, a dwelling place that Alice promised us a dwelling place near to thy heart. And we could ask, Father, that we might abide thus under the shadow of the Almighty. So we commit thy people to thee. We know that each one of us have responsibility just to go in the strength of the Lord. We have fortified and edified one another, but now it's up to us to be diligent in the truths that we pray. And now, God, we just come to thee to pray as the last meetings take place this evening. For those who are at a loss in the kingdom spoken about because they don't know thee, that they might Hear thy voice this evening. The Lord, we can mention names that we be prayed for in this assembly, but so many more are represented here. And we would just pray to give us a soul tonight. But now we use thy word in this humbly and reverently spoken that there might be someone that might come to Christ. And so, Father, we're thankful now. We're just so grateful that. We're in a land so privileged, so blessed to be able to gather as we are, and now to go our way and be fed yet again. We just thank you for all these countries and thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.